It's an obscure little one-season Japanese TV show from the 1960s, far overshadowed by his more famous cousins Godzilla and Ultraman. But despite all that, Ultra Q is one of the best genre TV shows ever made. It's difficult to talk about what makes Ultra Q so great without comparison to other equally great movies and TV shows whose own greatness must be defended. When describing it, I've often explained Ultra Q as a cross between Showa Godzilla, The Twilight Zone, and the British Avengers TV series. First, Godzilla. Ultra Q literally began as the Tokyo Broadcasting System approaching E.J. Tsuburaya, the special effects maestro behind Godzilla, to make a TV show for them for the 1966 season. In fact, many of the monsters make an appearance in Ultra Q in one way or another. The Godzilla suit was borrowed and repurposed for the monster Gomez, as was Baragon for the monster Pegos, King Kong for Goro, Manda for Kairu, and Maguma for Tadola. But Ultra Q and Showa Godzilla is more than just the kaiju. I've done an entire video on why Toho's non-Godzilla movies are so great, but I'll reiterate some key points. Though the most famous of Toho's mid-century films, Godzilla movies aren't even necessarily the best tokusatsu movies Toho made during the 1950s and 60s. I mean, Gojira is one of the greatest Japanese movies of all time. But as the Godzilla series dragged on, often the more interesting films and ideas were found in Toho's ancillary productions. Films like Atragon, The Mysterians, Battle in Outer Space, Frankenstein vs. Baragon, Gorath, The Last War, Dogara, and the Human Transformation series, and Matango. Even the Godzilla series itself started to cross-pollinate genres, from Godzilla as a potent, somber metaphor for the atomic bomb, to Godzilla fighting flying saucers on Planet X. Ultra Q draws inspiration from the entire breadth of Toho's Showa-era output. Yes, there are kaiju episodes, of course, but they're interspersed with a wider variety of science fiction and fantasy, sometimes even bizarrely postmodern art films, the episode Mammoth Flower has a kaiju of a sort, almost a Showa-era Biolante, as a giant, blood-sucking flower sprouts in Tokyo. Or a grow-up Little Turtle's modernization of the Japanese fairy tale of Urashima Taro. Or Baron Spider, which is essentially a haunted house story. Or The Underground Super Express Goes West, which starts out as a thriller aboard a new type of super bullet train, but ends... Well, I'm not exactly sure what it ends as. Or Kenagon's Cocoon, where a money-grubbing boy becomes a literally money-eating monster. Or how about the other direction, the episode one Eight's Project, where people are being shrunk down. Or the covert alien invasion of Challenge from the Year 2020. Or The Devil Child, where a young girl's good and evil impulses are separated into different entities. Ultra Q is a weekly, digestible, half-hour dose of everything great about Showa-era Japanese tokusatsu, from giant monsters to all points beyond. That weekly half-hour fix comes to us in a format and a vibe very much like that of the original Twilight Zone TV series. Debuting in 1959, the Twilight Zone defied the episodic television format by featuring new, original, disconnected science fiction, horror, and fantasy stories each week. The only thing close to a recurring character was series creator Rod Serling himself. Part of the show's surrealism was Serling's sudden appearance in the show's cold open. The camera pans away from the episode setup to Serling, standing there and smoking, who gives a description of the impossible events to unfold in the Twilight Zone, followed by a voiced-over moral at the episode's finale. The writing on the Twilight Zone is great all on its own, but the combination of Serling's presence and the famed music elevates it to an experience. Watching an episode of The Twilight Zone is like Rod Serling wrapping you in a cozy, albeit weird, blanket. It's an essential part of the show's mystique. If it doesn't have the music and Rod Serling, is it even really The Twilight Zone? Or like so many attempted revivals, is it just a sci-fi show with the brand name slapped on? Another Twilight Zone copycat, The Outer Limits, did something similar with its opening monologue by a voice controlling the transmission. Simply telling you that you have transgressed normality into a liminal space between fact and fantasy 
is an effective strategy for a half-hour or hour-long science fiction TV series. Ultra Q takes inspiration from the Twilight Zone in this fashion, as a Japanese tokusatsu take on the theme. In addition to having a different monster or story every week, it also has a narrator and a distinctive, groovy theme song. At the climax of the episode's opening, a voice intones that we live in an unbalanced zone and to prepare to have our mind and body separated for the next 30 minutes as we are swallowed into this mysterious time. And that is the overarching theme of Ultra Q. Something is wrong with the modern world. Something is unbalanced. Things are happening which should not happen, and it means something for the future of humankind. We never really find out what the it is, any more than we really figure out what the Twilight Zone is. Just before dropping you repeatedly, the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror ride at Walt Disney World presumes to take you into the Twilight Zone, which is a series of props from the series intro. The actual Twilight Zone is, in Serling's own words, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, between science and superstition, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. The Twilight Zone is not a place, and Ultra Q's unbalanced time is not really a time. It is now. It is then. It is tomorrow. It is whenever our reach has exceeded our grasp, and in the process, we have created monsters or become them. That gives us Showa Godzilla by way of the Twilight Zone. But unlike either, Ultra Q does give us a cast of characters to follow, and that invites comparisons to the great British spy-fi show, The Avengers. Like the Twilight Zone, I could probably do an entire video on The Avengers itself. In fact, the only cosplay I have ever done, the only time I've ever gone to a convention in a deliberate costume of something, was my now wife and I dressed as the Avengers. In particular, the fourth season of the Avengers is a knockout. It took a couple seasons to figure out the right formula, but once they did, it hit hard. Spy-fi is an informal genre applying science fiction ideas, tropes, and plots to the espionage thriller. James Bond went in a spy-fi direction many, many times, less so with Daniel Craig's gorilla stomping around, but definitely with Roger Moore, and even some of Sean Connery's more out-there adventures. But the Avengers gave us a weekly dose of it, as we followed the exploits of the dapper Mr. Steed and the sexy Mrs. Peel, themselves the embodiment of cool in swinging 60s Britannia. If you've never seen the Avengers, do it, especially the fourth season. Now, I don't think Ultra Q was directly inspired by the Avengers, like it was definitely inspired by Showa Godzilla and circumstantially inspired by the Twilight Zone. It merely invites a comparison as a weekly, science fiction-y show in glorious black and white that has a cast of investigators who we follow into their variety of different, strange scenarios. In the case of Ultra Q, our cast are a plucky girl reporter, played by Hiroko Sakurai, and a pair of intermittently bumbling pilots, played by Kenji Sahara and Yasuhiko Saiju, as well as a wizened professor, played by Yorio Igawa, and a tough old newspaper editor, played by Yoshifumi Tajima. Sahara and Tajima should be familiar to any fan of Godzilla. Sahara actually played in more Godzilla movies than any other actor, right from the beginning with a bit part in Gojira, through virtually every Showa film, to Minister Takeyuki Sagawa in the Heisei era, to his final part in Godzilla Final Wars. Circling back around to Showa Godzilla, Ultra Q is as much a who's who of Toho stable actors as her movies were. Guest stars included Hiroshi Kozumi, Akihiko Hirata, Akira Kubo, Yoshio Tsuchiya, Yun Tazaki, and Godzilla himself, Haru Nakajima. And because the comparisons are inevitable, I have to admit that I actually like the diversity of these original Ultra Monsters more than I like the Showa Godzilla lineup. Now, that's not to say that Godzilla, Mothra, Rodan, Ghidorah, Baragon, Hedera, and the gang are bad by any stretch of the imagination, but Eiji Tsuburaya really let his imagination fly with Ultra Q. The Mammoth Flower is great, exactly because it is just a giant flower. You don't see that very much. 
Showa Biolante. The giant slug Namagon and similarly snail-like Goga are also memorable designs, as is the giant inflated Belunga, the creature from the Black Lagoon-inspired Ragon, the money-hungry Canagon, and Peter. There are also the marvelous and enduring alien designs, like the Cicada Man and the Kimur. Supreme above them all, however, is the robot harbinger of global destruction, the dreaded agent of extraterrestrial apocalypse, the terrifying and awe-inspiring Garamon. There are a really interesting variety of kaiju and kaijin, and I wish the Godzilla series benefited from this unfettered originality. It was perhaps to be expected that the kaiju were the most popular part of Ultra Q. The series also fell victim to the Japanese tendency to run a show for a single season and move on. Many of my favorite anime are only a single season, which is fine if that's all the story you have to tell. A second season of Ultra Q was in development, but Tokyo Broadcasting thought they could do better to link the series with a heroic giant monster. From the ashes of Ultra Q came one of Japan's most enduring superheroes, Ultraman. The opener to Ultraman actually begins with Ultra Q Stinger, just to help audiences understand that Ultraman comes from the world of Ultra Q. Likewise, a number of monsters and aliens from Ultra Q resurfaced or were repurposed for Ultraman, including the alien Cicada Men as Balton, Kimur as Zeton, and Garamon as the friendly, human-sized Pigmon. Sixty subsequent years of Ultraman shows would bring back most of the Ultra Q monsters in one form or another. The 2022 film Shin Ultraman gives a nod to the classic Ultra Q monsters by having them act as the vanguard of kaiju that leads Ultraman to Earth. Since the original Ultra Q Gomez design was a repurposed Godzilla suit, Gomez in Shin Ultraman was repurposed from the Shin Gojira CGI files. As I said in the beginning, Ultra Q has been largely overshadowed by its more popular cousins. It's an understandable fate for many Japanese tokusatsu franchises. The Human Transformation series is also overshadowed by Godzilla, and the Daimajin and Yokai Monsters series are overshadowed by Gamera, who is himself overshadowed by Godzilla. But for anyone who hungers for more Showa-era Japanese sci-fi beyond the limitations of Ultraman and Godzilla monster brawls, and in the format of the mid-century sci-fi anthology show, Ultra Q fits the bill perfectly.